slate four, roll four. Well, I think you, you see a person stripped of all pretensions and some of the annoying, irritating habits they may have uh, become completely unimportant. The important thing is how they react in the most dramatic situation you can present, and that is when your life is on the line, when their life is on the line and yours, and that from that develops a very close understanding and camaraderie. Mm -hmm. What's the sort of feeling that you get when you come out together with someone after going through almost certain death? Well, uh, just that. Uh, Are you glad you're alive, for instance? Yeah. Oh yeah, but uh, then I think everybody is a supreme optimist. They always expect to be alive anyway. It's somebody else who gets killed. Mm -hmm. um, but you develop uh, an understanding, an unspoken uh, uh, rapport with that person, which never dies. It's always there. Mm -hmm. and yeah. When you're behind a camera and uh, you've got the, outs the outside world, there's things happening around about you, there's action, does it almost seem, looking through the viewfinder, that that outside world becomes unreal? Yeah, uh, that's also a little bit dangerous because you get the impression that you're actually looking at a television show and because you're looking through a, a, a viewfinder which is giving you actually the television screen mm. and some cameras it's actually marked that way. Mm. So it's um, dangerous to uh, get that feeling but uh, you do get the feeling that you're an onlooker and you're immune from, uh, from everything else that's happening around you. Is that ex does that explain why some cameramen will keep on filming even when they're under heavy fire? I think so, and also, but a lot of that is due to their training. If, if they're well-trained cameramen under any circumstances and they've gone through a lot of um, situations which may not be particularly dangerous but um, one has to keep filming and the idea is for a news cameraman get get the film and keep it rolling no matter what happens and if that's ingrained over a long period they tend to continue to do that those people surprise themselves they think oh I could never do that but then when they get to the situation very often they can do it can you immediately recall any touch and go situation where you took a chance and kept on filming even though someone's pointing a rifle at you or something similar um, yeah I guess that happened on a number of occasions but I I mean, one specific thing I do remember is in South Vietnam in 1972, uh, I was covering a very close action and I was covering a, um, a grenade thrower, the man I knew as the grenade thrower, he was an ace grenade thrower and he was a little section of only five men, they were South Vietnamese. And I'd known him before and uh, so I went with them. It was a big action overall but it was a big action is like a small action. You're only concerned about what happens to you there. And we're in a village in a little graveyard, overgrown graveyard, it's a Catholic village, on the outskirts, and the VC were in that graveyard. And he positioned himself, took almost everything off. He just had pants and a tight shirt and tight pants on, took his boots, everything off. And he had a little shopping bag, a plastic shopping bag, in which he carried his grenades. And his friends covered him with very accurate fire. As he crawled out to the closest, uh, tombstone, which gave him some cover and put his grenades along and he would just pick them off one after the other quickly and, and spray them where he knew the VC were. He did that three or four times, three times I think, and he came back and was, we were in a little bit of a ditch and he um, rolled over as he threw himself over the embankment, rolled down, sort of laughing and said, got them, that got them, they're gone. As it happened, they were, except for one or two. And he s sat up and on his knees and started to put his clothes back on, his protective clothes, his flak jacket, his steel jacket, uh, well, steel line jacket. And uh, at that stage I was filming him, I kept filming him, and there was a spray of gunfire uh, which went above my head and I could see behind him where it cut the leaves and into the tree. And he fell forward saying, the Vietnamese word chet, which is, means dead. Uh, we meant I'm dead, I suppose. But he, I thought, I kept on filming on him, and he, I thought he, I can't be hit. I didn't see him hit. But then he slowly stood up, and his flak jacket fell open. I could see he was stitched right across here. And his eyes were already going out of focus. So I had to make the decision, then what do I do? I mean, it's a man I know. 
but it's a great piece of film and maybe it will make other people feel something. And he's looking at me trying to say something and I just continued the film and within a few seconds he did in fact drop dead. Um, it, it was something I've, I agonized over but I did keep filming at that time because my training, all my training and my my whole life had been keep filming anyway, uh, but he was a man I knew well. Instinct again, almost. Uh, yeah. Yes. The photography just, becomes an instinct. Yes, and just to keep going and do it. Mm. And um, it did tell a very graphic story. That was the story that I did of that day, the story of the grenade thrower. Uh -huh. yeah. When you're hugging the ground and there's fire going on all around you and you're in a clear section, particularly vulnerable, does, does the thought go through your mind, hell, what am I doing here, or those people back oh, yeah. in America don't care anything about the footage that I'm, I'm yeah. showing anyway? Well, I dismiss the second thing. Uh, uh, if, uh, if you think about that too much, well then uh, it worries you that other people don't uh, have a feeling for it too. Um, so, but for the first thing, yes, I think, what the hell am I doing here, quite often. But uh, Why do it? Over. Why go back there? Why do it? What am I doing here? Mm. And uh, so why, why did you go back given the fact that you're wounded? Well, because when you, <laughs> when you get back into the, into the city, back into the mainstream, as you might say, uh, you realise it was uh, worthwhile because of what you did, if you did it, and you tell the truth and tell the story and try and get over the story of the situation. Take five. You say that uh, that you go back, and in, even though you've come very close to death and uh, you've been wounded, and in seeking the truth, or you think it's worthwhile that you you tell the truth, mm. but uh, you, before you said you, you tend to dismiss the second question or the second thing that I put to you that people back in America or Australia are largely divorced from what's happening over there, and uh, do they care anyway? Wh why do that? Well, I think it's important that you continue to try to explain to them. And when I said that I dismiss what they think, I'm t talking about the people in my office, say, for instance, who may want to dismiss it. I'm not talking about the people, the viewers, who can only learn uh, the truth and only try and get some feeling for it if somebody tells them and tries to present it in a way that they understand and sympathetically, rather than a whole great mishmash of war presented as a um, do a lot of personal stuff uh, such as the grenade thrower who lost his life I mean the end of the film on the grenade thrower was when he died and but beforehand had shown laughing and being very natural and doing his job as a soldier and I tried to do that with a, quite a lot of my filming too a personal thing mm -hmm. do you think there's some justification in people saying that that men go to war to prove themselves, and that journalists come and do the same? Yes, I think so. I think so. I think every man, maybe women too, I can't speak for them, but I think a lot of men uh, do feel that they uh, would like to know how they'd react in those circumstances. Uh, and you never know unless you do it. Uh, they know that they can handle uh, their lives as uh, in the normal course of things, they don't know how they'll react when their lives are directly threatened, uh, whether they will are able to um, take a certain course of action to save them or their families or, their, or whatever. And what, what sacrifices do you make to be a foreign cameraman as opposed to working in suburban Sydney or your ho yes. hometown ta Tasmania? Make a lot of personal sacrifices. You make a lot of personal sacrifices in your life. Um, for instance? Uh, for uh, family. You spend a lot of time away from your family and uh, I didn't marry for quite a long time much throughout the Vietnam War simply because it would have been com very unfair to my wife and family if you I had done children? that. I don't have children. I've only been married since the Vietnam War. Would you consider uh, having children given the risk that you take? I suppose I, I would, yes. Yes, I would. There's no suppose I would. Would that uh, limit mm. you somewhat in terms of the risk you're prepared to yes, take? Yes, I think, I think it would, yes. Mm -hmm.
so hence the hesitation to have them. Yes. Mm -hmm. There was an instance with a number of Australian and, and, and an English journalists killed in the Cholong area. Yes. What what do you make of the one journalist account who said that he escaped from that? Yes. Well, um, a number of us have serious reservations about the accuracy of his story. He was in the area. We don't believe he was on the vehicle at the time because the 